Welcome to our session um, title, A Year of Improvements to Your PowerShell Editing Experience. Hopefully you're having a good summit so far and lunch was pretty enjoyable. Um, welcome, my name is Sydney. I am a PM on the PowerShell team and I'm joined here by Andy who is a dev on the PowerShell team. And together we are two thirds of the VS Code um, extension for PowerShell uh, development team. We are missing our third member, Patrick, who lives on the East Coast and isn't able to be here today. But I'll let Andy introduce themselves a little bit. Hi, so it's really fun to be here. Um, I've actually been at Microsoft for nearly 10 years. I originally started with PowerShell. I just like to say my claim to fame was porting PowerShell over to a MacBook like we're using to demonstrate here today, as well as Linux. And I shuffled around the company. I'm actually now officially on the PowerShell team where I started what, two years ago with you now, Sydney? Yeah. Um, working with this brilliant uh, project manager of mine. And we, yeah, we run the extension for, Power, uh, for Visual Studio Code. So you can use PowerShell and edit to your heart's content and use the debugger. Um, this is gonna be a high level talk. We're going over just like the main features and, you know, I say features, but really mostly bug fixes that we've done over this past year to bring that experience actually up to snuff, like what it should be and what we want our users to um, expect out of the extension. We want it to be good and you know, usable, which it may not have been quite usable a few years ago, but we're working on it and it's improved a lot. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our, what, next slide here? Sure. Yeah, totally. And um, we designed this talk to leave plenty of time for questions and feedback, but if you do have comments or questions along the way, just feel free to raise your hand and we will be sure to get to you. Um, but first, at a high level, how many of y'all use the VS Code extension today? Awesome. So in the past year, we have had 12 stable releases of the extension, 36 preview releases, um, and um, we have about 380,000 monthly users of, of our stable extension and about 13,000 preview users. We would love to see that number go up. We're gonna demonstrate later like how to install the pre-release extension. It really helps us out when everybody uses the preview, so we know what bugs are up before they hit the rest of people. Um, so yeah, we want that number to go up, of course. In total, we have 8.1 million total installs of the extension. And then I wanted to include one other piece of telemetry that I think is just kind of interesting, um, which is we click telemetry on um, what platform folks are using the um, extension on. And you see we have about 77% are Windows users. Um, we have about 15% on Mac OS and about 7% on Linux. And this is just sort of interesting because if you look at our PowerShell telemetry all up, you'll notice that we're very heavy on Windows and Linux. And so sometimes we get the question of like, why do you guys spend all this time supporting Mac OS? And this is why, right? A lot of our developers still love to use Mac. Um, but the bulk of this presentation of what we want to talk about is really digging into what we've spent the last year doing, what features we've invested in, and what sort of our team has been up to. Um, so the first, um, or I'll go back, just focus on the first one. Um, so the first major thing we delivered about a year ago was a rewrite of our PowerShell pipeline execution with cancelable and ordered tasks. Um, so this is kind of a mouthful, um, and this was a really big rewrite of our PowerShell extension. This actually took us two years to complete this rewrite. Um, some of you guys might recognize the names of Tyler and Rob, and they started this work back in around 2019-ish. Um, and um, we started this in our preview extension um, and took uh, a couple years of only releasing this in our preview extension um, and had a separate development branch working on this work. And it finally released um, May of last year. And this represented a huge performance improvement to our um, PowerShell extension. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to say about this. Well, and especially the stability that it brought us uh, was tremendous. Like with the PowerShell editor services as it was written before 
what was essentially a rewrite, it was really difficult for us to track down bugs. There was just a lot of timing issues, a lot of just asynchronous problems, things stomping on each other when they shouldn't be. And this rewrite kind of gave us a, a sane representation of the work that the server had to do to both process the requests that come from the editor when it, it's trying to like show you symbols and whatnot, and also that extension terminal that comes up. Um, so by moving it all into a singular pipeline, we can actually run each one and cancel them when we need to, uh, which mostly just means not just the performance, but it's stable. Um, we don't just have like random things crashing in the middle of the process, not, not as much anymore. Um, so yeah, it was a tremendous amount of work. The reason that we're saying like this was work in the last year, even though as Sydney said, it started probably around 2019, was it took a couple years to get the rewrite going. Um, when I joined in 2020, Rob was like, hey, I've got this branch, we need to like get it merged. Um, we eventually merged it late, uh, mid 2021, late 2021, that was still in the preview extension. We really hadn't gotten to do a stable update for a while. And what we identified was like, yes, this rewrite was great, but we broke so many things in the process of rewriting the underlying server. Um, so we spent from 2021 into 2022 doing regression tests, which we'll show later. Um, but it was just thanks to all of the preview users, every bug that came in, we were able to identify it, fix it, write a regression test so that we knew it wouldn't break again on us. Um, and we're able to actually say around May 2022 that, hey, this is good enough to replace what was running and get launched um, into the stable extension, which was one year ago. Hence, this last year of PowerShell extension experience, like improvements, does include work that started in 2019. Sometimes things move slowly, but we really like to get it to the finish line. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, Andy made two points that I just would double down on and want to emphasize. One is Patrick and Andy coming on to the project and really bringing it to the finish line. Really awesome work there. And then the second point um, was, yeah, this work shipped in our preview extension. Um, I think I want to say October of um, 2021. Um, and it was just a huge testament to our preview users um, who used the extension, got us those bugs and got it to stable quality for us over the those six months um, and just how important those users are to our experience. Um, the next thing we wanted to emphasize was we had this improved um, user interface experience by using the built-in code icons. So um, in the PowerShell extension, we were originally using all of our own icons. So we had created our own GIFs and were using those. So in, in the extension, um, there's kind of like the play button and like the debugging. We'll demo these, so you, we'll show later on. But you kind of have your the icons in the extension. We were actually creating and shipping our own images um, in the extension. And so we instead integrated with VS Code's own icons. Um, and so this was a big improvement for us. I want to say a lot of that was like technical debt. We did have to ship our own icons because PowerShell did, uh, sorry, Visual Studio Code didn't have those icons built in for us to use at the time when this extension was first written, what, 2017? Or earlier than it might have been 2015. Um, but like once we were able to support the latest versions of VS Code, when those became available, it was just sort of tech debt to, hey, clean it up, make it look like the rest of the extensions that you see in VS Code, um, just using their stable APIs. Aha, okay, so really, this last year, um, once we got the rewrite in, that was great, but we still had so much work on the debugger. Um, obviously, like one of the most important things uh, for a user when they're writing PowerShell code is to be able to run it and say, hey, why did it not work as I expected? I need to be able to debug that. I need to be able to pause that code in the middle of its execution, view the variables, um, edit stuff as needed, and then rerun it. Um, and we want to be able to support that experience in Visual Studio Code. That's why the debugger and the extension exists but it was not very reliable, nor was it particularly usable. And through so, so, so much work um, between myself, between Patrick, between Justin over here, um, we've really brought it, uh, we've improved its quality a lot. I, I don't wanna say it's done. In fact, it's definitely not done when we get to new features. We'll talk about like some upcoming improvements to it, but we find for the most part, it's now very usable. Um, I think the next slide, yes, variable expansion. Uh, so we'll demo this, but, what it comes down to is like when you've paused that, uh, your PowerShell script in the debugger and you're at a breakpoint, you have in the left pane like a bunch of variables. 
oftentimes it would just crash. If you had a particular variable that you were looking at, you could easily crash the server underneath and then the extension would die. Um, we were able to fix that and make it more reliable. And we also were able to improve like how hash tables showed up. That was, that was Justin's work right there. Um, if you've got like a dictionary in PowerShell, now when you view them, you can just see the dictionary contents in a nice pretty manner. Um, so that variable expansion is a whole heck of a lot better. Um, and then moving from debugger, <laughs> Thing, something I'm very proud of is the read key fix. Uh, so this was definitely some work in this last year. If any of you previously used the extension, it like from years past on say a Mac, and you pasted something into the extension terminal, you might have seen the typewriter effect. Uh, this very old bug that used to hit us, where the way that we were pulling for characters in that extension terminal meant that we were literally pulling characters. So if you pasted something, you gave a bunch of input simultaneously, you would actually see that underlying, um, what's the word I'm looking for, implementation, where we're going, got a character, got the next character, got the next character. Um, instead of you know any other editor that you would see, you paste something, it's there instantly. Um, this kind of showed this underlying implementation bug where we had to just like pull for keys instead of just saying, hey, what characters did we get? The long and short of it is that the uh, console.readkey function available to us in .NET Core isn't cancelable, so we weren't able at the time to just call readkey, give me a character, and keep on doing that. We had to do this poll around it um, so we could sort of cancel in between polling. Um, that didn't work, That's, that was the cause of the bug, and .NET is not going to commit to ever giving us an asynchronous readkey where we could say, hey, we're waiting for a character, we need to cancel waiting for it and move on and do something else. We would otherwise just, we're, we'd be stuck waiting for that character. But we actually were able to kind of work around it. Uh, we now send a fake character. This is sort of in the nitty gritty, but yes, if we need to cancel a waiting read key call that's blocking our process, the client sends a fake character over, back down into the terminal, which read key goes, hey, I got my character, returns us back to our PowerShell like server execution and lets us move forward as if it got canceled. Um, it was a, a clever workaround, which I don't usually like to do clever workarounds, but given that we can't make it asynchronous, it's just that API doesn't exist and that we need to be able to cancel it, uh, we were able to fix this read key implementation. Now Windows, Linux, and Mac all use console.readkey underneath and it doesn't get stuck anymore. The typewriter effect goes away. Um, things are just a lot more stable because that process isn't stuck waiting for input. Uh, so that just, yeah, that was a fantastic improvement that we managed to work around. We've shared what we did with the .NET team. They, I think that honestly made them less likely to give us an asynchronous API because we did work around it. It is what it is. Um, one day I would love an asynchronous API. That's the right way to do it, which is be able to say, just cancel with a cancellation token. But hey, sending a fake character and discarding it works just as well. All right, ooh, testing improvements. Yeah. Just to go back to that last one, I just, it's one of my favorite ones because we used to get bugs opened on us all the time and people would open them the bug report and they say, um, can you turn off typewriter mode? Like, like, because it really seemed like we had a mode that was like making it seem like it was a typewriter or like, like, like it was typing. I don't know. It, it was a really good fix though. It was very clever. Um, but we talked about this a little bit before, but part of the rewrite um, we did um, over the course of 2019 and, and through um, and with the rewrite was a ton of testing improvements. Yes, we praise our um, preview users and we are so thankful when users open bugs. But at the same time, we want to have really robust testing so that as we make changes, as we can be really agile with accepting PRs, um, we can know that we're not breaking things. Um, so about last summer, I want to say like July, August of last year, we kind of said, we're going to take a pause on accepting PRs for about a month or so. And we're just going to put our heads down and we're going to write a ton of tests. So we made this big chart that I'll show you in a second of all the scenarios we could think of that we wanted to test for. Um, and we spent a month writing tests and I think it's been a really successful project um, to have our testing be a lot more robust. It might have even been like three months um, because we also had to turn on a lot of tests that had been disabled because of the rewrite. They just weren't compatible anymore. So yeah, we brought back tests that we had written and we added new ones and it was just, it was a lot of work. I gotta be honest, it's often easier to fix a bug than it is to be able to programmatically reproduce the bug in a test so you can assert that it's fixed and keep it fixed. That's 
that is often the hard part given how interactive something like the PowerShell extension is. And it's not always an easy decision, right? Like it's very gratifying when we get to fix bugs. So taking the step back to fit, make tests, not always an easy decision, but I think we're really happy with, um, with the decision. Um, and then this is a, another one um, that is a community contribution. Shout out Justin um, in the room here with us today. Um, but Justin did a major overhaul of our built-in snippet experience. And we just wanted to highlight this one um, just as an example of how important community contributions are to the PowerShell extension and the PowerShell um, project all up. You could say this for any number of um, PowerShell projects, but just a really good example of why community contributions are so important to the project. Um, and an example of like maybe a place too where um, you can find a niche too of like, right, a place where you can make a really big impact um, by, by choosing something and kind of doing um, a bit of an overhaul. Okay, yeah. Um, this has been a focus, I would say more so over the last six months, really. Um, and this has been Patrick's passion project probably over the last six months is figuring out how to make IntelliSense improvements. And this is not an easy problem by any means. IntelliSense is, can be a really finicky thing. Um, it can be difficult to reproduce these bugs. Um, they can happen and not happen. Um, and it can be difficult to debug, but Patrick has really gone all in on trying to make our IntelliSense experience really stable and really consistent. Um, so there's been a number of improvements that have happened, I would say, especially over the last six months. Um, and you'll see in a little bit, that's one of our goals for the next six months too, is to continue to make improvements um, there as well. Um, this is one small, big at the same time, right? Um, for a long time, we had the PowerShell integrated console. This is the console that's integrated with the PowerShell extension in VS Code. Um, a lot of confusion as to what it was. Um, because VS Code also had an integrated console. We renamed it to the PowerShell extension terminal, so hopefully that's clarified some things. Uh, the big change on this was just that that double usage of integrated was very confusing with VS Code, and they also called all of theirs terminals instead of consoles, and we just happened to be calling ours a console, which was just confusing. It kind of was a hate, like a hearkening back to like, um, the console you had in the ISE. I think that's probably why the name was originally chosen like that. But we did a request for comment publicly on the GitHub repository. Um, thank you to all the comments that helped us choose the new name for it. I know it doesn't seem like super fancy, but it was a very nice collaborative process to be like, what's the most concise and clear thing we can call this? Um, we added extension into there to be very clear we're talking about the one that the extension creates and uses underneath the covers as well because you have other PowerShell terminals that are integrated in Visual Studio Code. So now when it comes up itself, you'll see the name in it. It is the PowerShell extension terminal, which is also integrated, but we don't need to care about that because they're all integrated terminals. Um, so yeah, just thanks to people that participate in the GitHub repository that look at our issues that give us the comments, especially when we're specifically requesting that feedback. It was very helpful. This is kind of a fun one. So. Um, VS Code introduced the concept of a walkthrough, um, which is basically like a getting started experience that you can click through um, and it can give you tips, um, show you how to do certain things when you're getting started. Um, last summer, we got to have an intern on the PowerShell team and I thought it would be really useful to use this intern um, to have their project be to create a walkthrough for the VS Code extension. And I thought that this would be a really great experience because they themselves were a beginner to PowerShell, to the VS Code extension. So I thought they would bring a really unique perspective to this beginner experience. Um, so our intern last summer did a really intensive customer interview process, interviewed a ton of PowerShell users, both within our community, outside of our community, and put together, I think, a really awesome walkthrough experience, which I will demo. Um, so this was just a fun one that we got to add to the extension and good news too, um, she's awesome and she's coming back to the PowerShell team in the fall, so. The shout out I wanna give is, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, Sydney, our intern was a project manager and actually also ended up contributing code to the extension. So she really got that real experience of like, 
both these jobs are a little of some and a lot of the other. Um, so yeah, she still got to write, write a bit of code, work with the Git repository, open a pull request. We went through a review there and merged it. And I believe right as her internship was ending, we managed to ship it in preview. So she got to demo it live with like a real version of the um, extension, which was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. She did great work. Yeah. Okay, Ooh, were you talking about this one or me? I think you got it. Sure. Um, <laughs> so this is, I don't know exactly what I wanna say about this um, without getting into the nitty gritty details underneath, but like to run the PowerShell extension, we, there's really two parts of it. There's a server and a client. Um, you, you might hear me talk about this in other talks or in the repository. The client is the actual extension for Visual Studio Code, but it actually has to communicate with an LSP, a language server protocol server, another binary in the background. That is the PowerShell process that we start in the extension terminal, and it's what it does is it loads the PowerShell editor services module. Um, that editor services module is an implementation of an LSP server. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to implement the entire server. We use a major and popular library underneath by the Omnisharp team called C Sharp Language Server Protocol. That is this uh, client server, it's a server library, not a client library, sorry about that. Um, it's an LSP server library that uh, as one of the main like big users of it, we're often finding bugs in and having to get those fixed contributed back and working with these, they're, they're not at Microsoft, it's actually like a more publicly maintained project. So working with them across the open source world to be like, hey, this is an issue we identified in our use of it, here is a fix for it, please take the fix. Now can you please get like a release out so we can take the updated release and eventually ship that in our server, which is the backend to the client, which is the extension and kind of bundled as such. Um, so yeah, we've done a lot of work getting updates to the LSP server library. Um, and as far as the important compliance work goes, I think this was a little more than a year ago, but uh, one of the reasons in that first slide we were able to say, hey, we did all of these releases is that we made this super awesome automated compliant pipeline that lets us do a release. I really just have to one run script on my laptop. It compiles all the stuff from the change logs it makes the branches, it pushes it to a backend server in Azure DevOps, and that server, in an automated fashion, builds everything, tests all of it, gets the libraries signed, um, moves, uh, ships the server stuff to the next pipeline, which is the client, does the same thing again, builds all of it, tests the client, um, takes all of that, bundles it, pushes it out to the GitHub releases, and then kind of waits for us to click a cool button to say yes, push it to the marketplace. So it's all happening in like a secure, compliant server. Um, it's not coming off of our laptops, which is really important. And because it's so automated, we can do a release in like, honestly, it takes more time just waiting for it. I run the script, I wait 10 minutes for the script to finish, I push the branches, the pipeline runs, after an hour I can click release. Um, that lets us really get bug fixes out and tested with our preview users super fast, really love it. What more is there to say? <laughs> Major performance improvements <laughs> across all features. <laughs> okay, so this was some more recent stuff. Uh, I would say late into last year and early this year, I got to work on like rewriting some of the symbols. This was a collaborative effort with another community member um, who was like, hey, we really should support classes as symbols. And I'm like, yeah, of course we should. In fact, it was issue number three not 30, not 300, not 3,000. It was issue number three in the PowerShell Editor Services repository of classes should be symbols. Um, and he started on this and got like a long way into it. I'm like, and I'm reviewing his code. I'm like, okay, I see where you're going with this. I like that it adds it, but I'm also identifying a whole lot of cruft because again, this project has been ongoing for probably close to a decade. Um, and so we took the time to, I kind of paused on his pull request, I'm like, I love it, love to see it. I need to rewrite the stuff underneath so that you can do what you're trying to do more easily. And so we rewrote all the symbol logic underneath. We cut out a whole bunch of cruft. We um, actually built on top of some of Patrick's work for the code lenses, uh, which essentially lets us just really, really quickly build up symbols on files as they're accessed or in the background. Um, and that's actually configurable. And then given just like a cached table of symbols, uh, we were able to 
add more symbols to it, like the classes, like enums and enum values, and we were able to improve stuff like go to definition across functions and now methods and those enum values and those classes. Um, all of that actually just works a whole heck of a lot better now, and it's not done every single time the file is looked at. It's actually only done as necessary, and it's done in a faster manner as well. So we have exactly one, it's called a visitor, that actually like parses your script. We do it as needed um, and no more than that instead of, I think it used to happen six times on each request, which was really bad. It was just, it was just the cruft underneath. But hey, rewrites are great um, when you can see, like, with hindsight, rewrite lets you, with hindsight, see what you're trying to do and do it better. And I really appreciate that we've been given the time to actually, like, do some of these improvements. Ooh, fun one. Fun one. Okay, this was, this was pretty recent. What was it? A month ago? Yeah. About a month ago? Maybe two months ago? Um, so for a long time, a few years, we've had two extensions in the marketplace. So we've had PowerShell extension, and then we've had the PowerShell preview extension. And just about a month ago, um, we adopted the VS Code feature, which wasn't available at the time when we created these two separate extensions, which is the pre-release feature of an extension. So what we did is we now have a single extension, the PowerShell extension in the VS Code Marketplace, and now it has a pre-release channel. So now you just need one extension, and if you want to opt into the pre-release channel, you just switch to the pre-release channel. Um, and what's really great about this too is we worked with the VS Code team, and they automatically migrated all the users of the pre, preview, pre, preview extension. They automatically migrated all users of the preview extension into the pre-release channel. So if you were using that, don't need to do anything. You've already been migrated. Um, and now we've deprecated that preview extension. So now one extension, pre-release channel. Um, and yeah, we can show you that as well. But I think that's about it. Pause, breathe, questions, demo time. Awesome, demo time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, think, I think Andy's going to go first. OK. Oh, I need to uh, ship some stuff over. The, the resolution changed. Um, additional views. Very big font here. OK. We can all see this? Great. Uh, sorry. Font is massive, but that should help with readability. So the first thing I'm going to demo is the, some of the improvements to um, the debugger. In fact, like sub first thing is pointing out some of those code icons. Um, these icons are those that we used to contribute with our GIFs, and now that they have code icons, it's just, it's just the same triangle like you see over here, which is kind of nice, and we got to delete a GIF out of the repo. You know, fun stuff. So I've got this script up called variable test. You can see it's just got a whole lot of different kinds of variables in here, um, like a process variable, there's uh, an array, there, um, there's an association array or like a dictionary right here. I'm going to go ahead and click our run button, which automatically launches it in the debugger. I have set one breakpoint right here. So it runs, and check this out. You have all of your variables. Um, obviously, variables in the debugger. That's been around for a long time. But this was Justin's improvement, like your association array. You can actually just see when you pull into, oh, first child, child, second child, 42. Like The view of it is a lot improved. Uh, what you used to see is what's now tucked under the raw view. Um, which you'd have to like kind of dig in and see all of this and be like, oh, I have some keys. Okay, what do those correspond to? Oh, some values. Um, Justin did absolutely fantastic work and was like, we can do this just like the C Sharp extension and show you your association array of like, first child has the definition of child and second child has the definition of 42. So that was some fantastic work. And as we were working on all of this, um, we were able to identify some uh, bugs that used to crash the extension. Uh, my favorite is demonstrable with proc var right here. So proc var ran git process with the pit of the current process. So it's a running process. It, it's the current PowerShell process right now. Um, and if you look at the variables of this, uh, uh, the fields of this variable proc var, you can see it's the PowerShell process. You can view all of these properties. And well, some properties like exit code and exit time there's an error. Of course there's an error. The process hasn't exited yet, so if you try to get exit code, it errors and says process must exit before determining requested information. Um, 
yeah, unfortunately, that used to crash the extension because we weren't expecting to have errors looking at the values of fields of variables. Well, fortunately, we were able to figure out what was going on, put a catch around this as you would expect it to do because this is an expected error. Yes, there was an error. We caught it. That's fine. We display the message, and you can continue debugging, which, yay, um, I really hated when people would be like, the debugger crashed, and I looked at him like, that's so dumb, it shouldn't have crashed there. I mean, of course, the exit code can't be retrieved. Um, so those are some of the improvements we've done for the debugger. Gosh, we could like go on forever on the debugger, but I will try not to. So we'll just go ahead and stop the debugger and move to the next other demo. So this is another file, just types and classes. Both these scripts I'm actually showing come from our tests. Um, all of the stuff that I'm talking about, we have regression tests that are automated and make sure that all this stuff still works, which is cool. Um, but some more recent work that was uh, that collaboration on symbols with our uh, community member was making stuff like class superclass a you know an actual symbol. So on the left here is outline view. Um, you're probably most familiar with the Explorer and looking at the files. Well, in the same left-hand pane of VS Code. Um, you can go ahead and look at the outline of your file, which shows you all of your symbols, which is kind of really great. Um, enums are first class citizens as well, and uh, going to definitions works. Like, look at that. I went to first on my enum down here where I'm using it, and it's showing me. Of course, it came from there. That's the definition. And if I, with really long fingers, do you want me to hold the mic for you? Uh, I think I got it. Okay. Do you jump to definition? There we go. You can actually jump to the definition of that. And I believe that works, yep, same for something like this. Um, so enums now work properly, but really cool, and I hope this one works, uh, is saying like, hey, we have an object over here. We're calling my class method on it. Well, what's the definition of that? Oh, well, we don't know precisely, but instead of giving up, which is what we used to do, and just be like, there's no definition, we say, well, it looks like it could be one of these three class methods. There's obviously improvements to be made. Like, as a developer, you can you can look at this and say, oh, it's not taking any arguments, so we know which one, it, which overload it is. Um, we haven't gotten to that improvement, but it, my philosophy is like, better is obviously better than not working at all. Um, so being able to say, hey, we at least know what methods are called my class method, and show you those three right here. So it's one of these three, uh, which, heck, sorry, I think it's a hell of a lot better to be able to go to my class method, even if it might be one of these two, and you have to do the little bit of work to say which one of the three it is, rather than just saying, sorry, we have no definitions for that. Um, so it's kind of a, a best effort basis with these symbols, and in my experience in testing so far, I think it works a lot better, and it's just a more user-friendly sort of experience. Um, properties on classes work too. That just took me right to the definition of uh, some prop right there. Um, I think this one inside the class definition works. Um, yeah, you can jump to your symbols here. This was just, I really love doing this work with Frode. We, I, that might not be how you pronounce his name, but uh, that's, the, that's the string that I see when we're working together on GitHub. Um, we have proper symbols, more of these proper code icons on all of these, and looking at symbols across an entire workspace um, works really well now too. So you can do this and be like, give me, uh, variables or things that start with var. Um, this used to be really, really, really slow, but those performance improvements that I was talking about means that I, I was able to test this on uh, the MSSQL, or no, sorry, it's DBA tools repository, which is one of the largest repositories I've ever seen. We, we have a user that comes in with performance issues a lot. Um, and as far as I can tell, she hasn't had a performance issue since we managed to fix this. Um, the these populate really quickly. Once they've populated, they don't try to re-update until absolutely necessary. So yeah, you can dive into your symbols. You can use the outline view. You can go to definition now. Um, it was it was some really great work. It was a lot of fun, uh, and I just I love the output of it because it's just such a like a visual feature-driven sort of fix that should have been there all along. But hey, you know, everything takes time, and we got to it. Um, what were our other demos? You wanted to demo the marketplace? Yeah, I can demo I can demo a few things. Um, and then we can go back to our slide and see if we forgot anything to demo. Um, do you want to hold the mic? Sure. Maybe my, my mic stand. Um, well, first thing I, I can remember that I wanted to show um, is pretty fun, which is, con so control shift P, if you aren't familiar, that will open up the command palette for you and then you can start typing in PowerShell and you can see every single thing you can do with the PowerShell extension, which is pretty fun. One thing I wanted to show was upload bug report to GitHub because this is very, very important to us because it really helps us make improvements 
to the PowerShell extension. If you don't file bug reports, we have a really hard time knowing what's broken. Um, so if you click on that, it will go ahead and open our issue template for us in our VS Code repo. And you can go ahead and file an issue for us. And the thing I always like to tell people is that you do not have to be an expert to open a bug report. In fact, if you are, are not an expert, all the better. It probably is going to give us better information um, and give us a more accurate picture of what the average user is running to and what the average user is hitting. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, if you're like, I know sometimes, like especially if I'm in a new repo, not familiar, like I get nervous sometimes, like opening a bug report, like are they going to like be mad at me? Like is it? I don't know. I get nervous about that. The one piece of advice I would say is just like use the form. You use the form, we are going to be, you're going to be our best friend. We're going to be so happy with you um, and so grateful for you for opening the issue. And when you <laughs> use that command to open a bug report like this, it actually does some of the work for you and fills out PowerShell version when it can, as well as Visual Studio Code version and extension version. Um, so you don't have to go hunt that information down. Just use the built-in command whenever possible. And we'll get better information and it's less work for you. And I'll let you in on a little insider tip, um, which is that Patrick and Andy, really good at triaging the repo. We'll get back to you probably very soon. If not, um, we triage the, the repo every Tuesday. So you'll hear from us um, probably on a Tuesday, if not sooner. Um, probably not this Tuesday, <laughs> like today. Today. That, yeah, we skipped that meeting this canceled. morning. Canceled. We canceled this morning um, because, you know, PowerShell Summit. <laughs> but aside from that, usually. Uh, there's you, only three of us. <laughs> there's only three of us, and two of us are right here. <laughs> um, but one other thing why I have GitHub open. Actually, two other things that I wanted to show you. Um, one other thing was, since I mentioned it, the regression test um, issue. You can see we do actually like all of our project planning is out in the open on GitHub. So if you're ever curious like what the team is up to, what we're working on, um, here's just one example. This was the issue I was talking about. These were the tests that we decided to, to work on. Um, you can see we moved it through all <laughs> sorts of <laughs> all sorts of projects, lots of comments, what was going on there. Each and every single one of those bullet points was a lot of work individually. You can see both generally where um, the pull request was merged as well as the initial like bug report of like, hey, this is broken, um, can you fix it? So yeah, this was us trying to be like, well, we know what our users are trying to do and where it's not working, let's fix it and make sure it never breaks again to the best of our capabilities anyway. And then um, what we do, um, in terms of like long-term project planning, we generally, um, we try and release preview releases whenever we have bug fixes, and then we generally try and do a stable release as often as we have a, a few bug fixes in, or as often as we have a couple of good stable re or preview releases, but in general, once a month. Um, and then we do like longer-term planning about every six months, and we do that in using GitHub projects. Um, and so I'm just like, here's an example of a GitHub project we had, American Pharaoh. You can see that we had our to-do, our progress. Did 131 pull requests and bugs closed and whatnot. So and we only punted three, so we were pretty three. proud of that. Yeah. So this is one, um, this is another one that we had. Um, That's about our average, right? Around 130 yeah. each project. And I can show you um, the one that we're working on right now that we just, we just started a new one. It's called Flying Fox. Um, it's very much in progress do. You might notice a pattern about it. This is another like little fun fact, a little tidbit, is that um, we name them after horses. Did anyone pick up on that? Yeah? <laughs> yeah, stable releases. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're very creative. Yeah. You might also notice those numbers don't add up to 130. That's because in our experience, the majority of our work pops up as we're working on it, mostly thanks to preview users filing bugs with us. So yeah. please do, because that number's got to go way up. Yeah, we start conservative and then it yeah. grows. Yeah. Um, OK, other things I was going to show were the market, extension marketplace. So we got the extension marketplace. I was going to show, you type in PowerShell. You can see, as I mentioned, our preview extension has now been deprecated. Um, and now we have, does this not scroll? Oh, well, there we go. Switch to pre-release version. And so this is really cool because you can really easily like say, oh, it's not working for me today. You guys broke it. File that bug report with us and then click that button to switch back to release and get on with your work. And as soon as we've got it fixed and a new pre-release comes out, 
please come back and switch it back to pre-release and test it out and let us know. That's how we're able to make this better. We really can't without users testing and letting us know when things are working and not working. Um, so we really like that instead of having to shuffle you between two extensions, disabling and re-enabling, you can just so easily click one button and it works. Um, and in fact, if you go to here um, and need to move versions, I believe you can click this and you can go back to even older versions. This is just part of the VS Code marketplace, but like if you found that it's broken even in this stable release, start going back through these. Find where it starts working correctly. Let us know that. That helps us like narrow down where we might have broken it in code. Um, yeah, that's we love that. Pre-release is great. One other extension that I was going to point out that we actually, um, the PowerShell team contributed to is called Polyglot Notebooks. And so this is a um, notebook experience it's powered by .NET. Um, it's owned by the .NET team, but the PowerShell team did contribute to this. Um, and it's a, a notebook experience um, that has a bunch of different languages supported in it. So it has C Sharp, F Sharp, PowerShell, JavaScript, SQL, KQL, Python, and R, all in a single notebook experience. Um, and it's available in VS Code, but it's also portable to other um, Jupyter Notebook experiences. So you can install um, it in VS Code, and then if you create a new file, um, it'll give you this option to create a new Polyglot Notebook. Um, and it's gonna, I've already set mine to like default to being a PowerShell Notebook, but you can, once you do that on the first time, it'll ask you like which language you're gonna want. So you can do PowerShell, and then it's gonna, you can, if you aren't familiar with notebooks, it allows you to have executable code mixed with um, Markdown. So it's just kind of a cool um, experience to check out. But I know we only have like three minutes left, so I'm gonna pause there and just see if there were any questions or also like feedback on VS Code and PowerShell and VS Code, anything like that. Oh yeah, the walkthrough experience. Let's see. Um, and walk through. Um, so I just open the command palette and then type walk through if you couldn't see that. So there's a get started with PowerShell. Um, and so it's gonna give you some like st steps to getting started with PowerShell. So um, first, if you don't already have PowerShell 7 installed, it's gonna tell you how you can do that. Um, it's gonna show you how to create a PowerShell file, um, how to switch between PowerShell 7 and PowerShell 5.1 how to toggle between ISC mode and not ISC mode, um, open the extension terminal, um, and then it's gonna give you more resources um, for like documentation, how to um, get started with the PowerShell community, which is actually reminding me, sorry for like the very chaotic end to this session. I do apologize for that. <laughs> we were gonna share like a few more things, um, which is our upcoming work um, we showed you a little bit in Flying Fox, if you were curious, um, but we are continuing to make improvements to the PowerShell extension, and this is what we have um, planned for the upcoming um, semester, so the upcoming six months. So continued work on IntelliSense. Um, startup failure handling is coming very soon, as in the preview is shipping today, today probably. Um, simpler usage of PowerShell editor services, which is like sort of the back end of the VS Code extension for non-VS Code hosts. Um, with 5.1 write output support, we figured out what's going on and we have a workaround we're working on to see if we can actually solve the issue. Um, we're working on PS read line preview incorporation and um, de debugging breakpoint sync. I don't know if you want to speak on that. Um, yeah, just, just the real quick highlights uh, on some of those. The startup failure handling, I've noticed in the last six months or so a lot of issues getting open of like, hey, it just didn't start up and it gave me error undefined, which is not super helpful. And it usually came down to um, somebody was trying to use PowerShell 7.0 or 7.1, which reached end of life, or they're using Windows PowerShell but don't have the necessary .NET framework. Uh, once we were able to figure out what the bugs were there, uh, I went through and updated that error handling. So now when it fails, if it detects it's because you were trying to use 7.0, in the next preview it will tell you exactly what happened and give you a button to click to go get PowerShell 7.2, or if it was Windows 
PowerShell you were using, it tells you how to go get the updated.NET framework so you can actually get that fixed and move on and not just have to come to me and me explain what's wrong anymore. The editor does it for you instead, which is how it should be. Um, the write output support, this left support more of a long running bug of users saying, hey, when I'm using Windows PowerShell, after some amount of time, it just stops like displaying any output. Turns out it's caused because a transcript is running in the background. Everybody so far has been able to find, yeah, I've got start transcript in my profile, and that's causing that. We know the cause. We don't know a fix for that yet besides not running start transcript, but now we know it, we can work on it. Um, that PS Readline preview incorporation, just in that pre-release, we want to have previews of PS Readline, so that's tested at the same time. And the debugging breakpoint sync is kind of this big project to let you be able to run like set PS breakpoint in the extension terminal and have that automatically use the event handler in VS Code to put the breakpoint in VS Code's debugger. So those two states sync up better. Um, Patrick's working on that. We're going to try to get it in fairly soon. And that's that. Thanks for coming to our session. Feel free to catch us in the hallway and ask us questions. I know we didn't really give time. Yeah, we'll be around.